Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, final event in the Tackling Tech Facilitated Violence um, Conference. Um, the, uh, this last um, conversation is going to focus on technology facilitated domestic violence against immigrant and refugee women. And we are um, lucky to have with us uh, today um, from uh, Australia, Professor Nicola Henry, uh, Yiman Louis from uh, RMIT, a PhD candidate, and Deepa Matu, who is the executive director of the Bar Barbara Schleifer Com Commemorative Clinic. And I'll give you a I'll give you a, a little more detail as each of them on each of them um, before they present. But for now, to say welcome. And what I'd like to do is I'll I'll provide a, a land acknowledgement. Um, and then I'll do some more detailed introductions and, and let you know um, and let you know the order that we're planning to proceed in. So I, I'm coming to you today from unceded Algonquin territory. Um, we pay respect to the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians of this land. We acknowledge their longstanding relationship with this territory, which, as I said, remains unceded. We pay respect to all Indigenous people in this region from all nations across Canada who call Ottawa home. We acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honour their courageous leaders past, present and future. So uh, our first speaker today um, will be uh, Associate Professor Nicola Henry, um, who is the Australian Research Council Future Fellow in Social and Global Studies at the Social and Global Studies Centre at RMIT University in Melbourne, Australia. Her research investigates the prevalence, nature and impacts of gendered violence including the legal and non-legal response to these harms in Australian and international contexts. And Nicola will be speaking um, based on a, a co-authored paper uh, that was published in 2021 called Technology Facilitated Domestic Violence Against Immigrant and Refugee Women, a Qualitative Study, uh, co-authored with Stephanie Vasile, Asher Flynn, Karen Kellard, and Colette Mortreux. After we've heard from Nicola, um, I'll invite uh, Yi Man Lui, who is a PhD candidate at the School of Media and Communications at RMIT University, also in Melbourne, where it is very, very early in the morning and we thank them for, for being here. Uh, Yi Man is a survivor advocate and her research explores the intersection of technology and domestic violence, particularly um, in relation to Chinese migrant women, victim survivors lived experience and their relationship with communication technology. And after Iman's comments, um, we will move to uh, Deepa Matu, who is the executive director of the Barbara Schleifer Comm Commemorative Clinic. Previously, she was the clinic's director of legal services. And before joining the Schleifer Clinic, um, Deepa was the project coordinator, staff lawyer, and executive director at the South Asian Legal Clinic of Ontario. As executive director at the clinic, uh, currently, Deepa oversees its strategic direction and provides leadership to the legal, counseling, and interpretation departments. So um, I'm going to turn it over then, thank all of our, our participants, our speakers, and I'll turn it over to, to Nicola to, to lead us off. And what we'll do after each person has um, had their opportunity to speak, I'll um, and invite questions from the audience and we'll have a, a Q&A session at the end. Um, please feel free to post your questions either in Q&A or in, um, or in uh, chat, if that's an, an option that's available to you. So I'll turn it over to you, Nicola, and thank you again for being so bright-eyed and bushy-tailed at such, a, um, uh, such an early hour in the morning in Australia. Thank you so much, Jane. I, I'm not sure how bushy-eyed and bright-eyed uh, I am. I'm just um, going to share my screen now, hopefully, 
that everyone can see that okay. Okay, so um, thank you so much um, to, to Jane for kindly inviting me to present at this wonderful panel today. And thanks everyone for, for coming. Before I begin, I would like to pay my respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, including their elders past, present and emerging. And acknowledge that today I'm speaking to you from the beautiful lands of the Wurundjeri people. So as Jane said, I'm presenting today on technology facilitated domestic violence against immigrant and refugee women. Um, and as Jane also said, the presentation is based on a co-authored article that recently was published. And the research was funded by the Office of uh, the Australian Office of the E-Safety Commissioner. Global estimates reveal that domestic and sexual violence are experienced by large numbers of women worldwide. According to the World Health Organization, almost one in three have experienced physical and or sexual violence by an intimate partner in their lifetime. In Australia, population surveys show that one in six women have experienced physical and or sexual violence by a cohabiting partner since the age of 15, and that one in four women have experienced emotional abuse by a current or former partner, again, since the age of 15. The COVID-19 pandemic has coincided either with the first onset of domestic violence for many women or the increase in the frequency or severity of the abuse. And technology certainly is playing a role in the abuse of women, both, both pre and post COVID. While national and international estimates clearly show that many women experience domestic violence, a key question is, do immigrant and refugee women experience more or less domestic violence than other women? Several studies from Australia, Canada and the US have found lower rates of intimate partner violence among immigrant and refugee women. Oh, sorry, groups. However, results from these studies should be interpreted cautiously due to some methodological constraints. For example, English only surveys and interviews or low reporting rates among, um, around domestic violence among respondents from immigrant and refugee backgrounds. So while we don't really know the answer to the question about whether or not immigrant and refugee women experience more or less domestic violence than other women, we do know from qualitative research that the nature of violence experienced by immigrant and refugee women may be different. So some studies have documented multiple forms and types, and these include, for example, economic abuse, such as forced labor and, and dowry related abuse, physical and sexual violence, emotional abuse, social isolation, and immigration related violence. Studies have also found that immigrant and refugee women experience domestic violence from extended family members, including relatives overseas. Researchers have also explored the multiple impacts of domestic violence, highlighting the effects on physical and mental health, as well as material impacts, such as homelessness and poverty. And some of these are similar to what non-immigrant women also experience, but the nature of those impacts may also be different. Researchers have also focused on the unique barriers faced by immigrant and refugee women in terms of help seeking, <coughs> excuse me, which may occur at a range of levels and include personal factors such as self-blame and concern for children, as well as structural factors such as financial insecurity or dependency, insecure housing and uncertain resident status. Immigrant and refugee women may also experience challenges in accessing support from mainstream services due to the availability of information due to immigration laws, the lack of language and culturally appropriate services, and a fear of or a lack of knowledge concerning the legal and social support systems. So overall, the research on domestic violence shows that women who are socially isolated are at greater risk, and this of course is a particular issue for recently arrived women who may be, to quote Margaret Abraham, emotionally and socially alone, economically confined and culturally disconnected. The domestic violence research also more broadly shows that low, so, low socioeconomic status is a factor in domestic violence and so is male dominance in the family. And this has specific implications for immigrant and refugee women and their families who may experience downward social mobility or may be pushed into precarious employment as a result of migration. While studies also show that women may also be disadvantaged by changes in gender roles which are affected by the migration process. I'm sorry, my cat, I have to just pause the video. My cat is going crazy just a second. I'm so sorry.
I'm sorry about that. Um, there's some possums on our, um, <laughs> that my cat's quite interested in. Um, okay, hopefully he doesn't interrupt us again. Um, all right, so just in relation to the study that we conducted focusing on technology facilitated domestic violence um, against immigrant and refugee women, our, the aim of our study was to explore the experiences of those women and also to understand the impacts and to investigate women's help seeking pathways and sources of support. So we conducted semi-structured interviews and online discussions with 29 victim survivors, as well as interviews with 20 stakeholders from frontline organisations who support um, women experiencing tech facilitated abuse. So these included, for, for instance, domestic violence support services and legal and health services. Just to give you a bit of an idea about the technology and um, the terminology, we draw on Douglas Harris and Dragowitz's term, technology facilitated domestic violence, to refer to the use of technologies to threaten, harass, control, or punish victims in the context of intimate partner violence. So behaviors include things like harassing messages and texts and, and threats, monitoring, tracking, and stalking behaviors, image-based sexual abuse, destroying or restricting access to technology and impersonation. We follow Jasmine Shen's use of immigrant and refugee women to, to refer to women who were born overseas or whose parents or grandparents were born overseas in non-main English speaking countries. This term recognizes a diverse cohort of women who may have unique histories, life circumstances and migration pathways. In our study, we found that many of the forms of tech facilitated abuse that participants reported were not dissimilar from the forms that have been documented among other groups of women in the community who are from non-immigrant and refugee backgrounds. However, we found that for many participants, their insecure migration status, their geographical isolation from family and friends, as well as their ethnic or religious backgrounds were used by perpetrators to enact technology facilitated violence and abuse. The stakeholders we spoke to described the technology as an extended platform to amplify the multiple forms of abuse experienced by immigrant and refugee women. So for the next few slides, I'll discuss the, the four main ways that perpetrators use digital technologies in the context of domestic violence. The first and most common behaviour discussed in our study was the sending of harassing messages and threats by abusive partners or other family members such as parents and in-laws. This form of abuse often started or escalated when the victim survivor left an abusive relationship. So in the words of one victim survivor, I've just come out of an abusive relationship. I spent a whole 12 months trying to get out of that relationship and last year I blocked that person on Facebook and then I just got repeated messages. Are you serious? You blocked me. Like unblock me. Don't be ridiculous. Unblock me. Unblock me. Unblock me. And I felt it was safer to unblock them than to get continuous harassment of him rocking up at my place. I unblocked to diffuse but restricted access and then I just kept getting harassed. The incessant nature of the messages experienced by victim survivors was described in terms of constant and 24-7 abuse, even when the perpetrator was physically absent. As one stakeholder described, the thing about online technology facilitated stalking and abuse is there's no, no place where he can't find you, and there's no time of the day where he can't find you. And that sense of being unable to escape at anywhere both heightens the sense of threat and heightens the isolation that the woman is experiencing. Some women receive death threats via text messaging from the perpetrator's family or friends, while other participants describe family members using text messaging and email to compel the woman to remain in the relationship. As one stakeholder told us, she would then leave the perpetrator and then he would send a lot of emails and texts to her family back overseas. So then her family back overseas would then also send her horrible emails and horrible text messages telling her that she had to get back with him. The use of digital technologies to communicate threats of deportation or the removal of visa sponsorship was also made by perpetrators. And to quote one stakeholder, one of the largest and overarching fears is about immigration status. It actually didn't really matter what their status was because even women who had refugee status and therefore were really sort of permanent citizens didn't necessarily understand the rights that, that gave them. So they were still afraid of the, or the perpetrator would tell them that they could get them deported or they could get their kids removed. 
stakeholders observed that while perpetrators may not necessarily act on the threats made using digital technologies, insecure migration status was frequently used as a form of leverage and part of a broader, broader, broader pattern of controlling behaviour. In other words, digital technologies make it easier for perpetrators to prevent their partners from leaving the relationship or seeking support from family members or domestic violence support services. Second, stakeholders commonly reported the tracking of women's physical movements via location services through social media or apps on their smartphones, along with other devices such as car tracking devices. Some stakeholders reported that children were also being used by perpetrators to keep track of victim survivors, including through social media or devices covertly placed in children's strollers or toys. A WESNET study conducted in Australia last year found a 244.8% increase in frontline workers reporting perpetrators' use of GPS tracking of victim survivors, and a 183.2% increase in the use of cameras compared to when they did the last survey in 2015, so huge increases. In our study, several participants reported that their partners had purchased and set up their mobile phones and added passwords to their apps and, and installed tracking software. So for instance, according to Layla, a victim survivor, my ex-husband used the phone to track me everywhere. Wherever I go, he knows where I am. And after we divorced, he tried to get information on Facebook and he got my photo to make the account of me and he harasses me by phone. He texted me all the time and taught all the rubbish things. And one time, I didn't know, but one time he said, wherever I go with who, who and whatever I do, he knows. Because before I buy the phone, he activates the phone for me. He sets up the phone so he can track me anywhere. In some cases, women were unaware that software had been installed. So again, uh, in the words of Amara, a victim survivor, he was stalking me nonstop everywhere, like at schools, here, there, that kind of thing and it's still continuing. He lives a good 45 minutes drive from me and he used to be up in my area stalking me every day. There's been times I'm walking along the street and there comes along a car and his arms waving at me. As Delaney Woodblock has observed, technologies enable perpetrators to quote, create a sense of omnipresence in women's lives, giving them the means to control and monitor them from a distance, both during the relationship and also upon separation. As a stakeholder in our study observed, this can lead to further isolation, distrust, and increased anxiety. And to quote from a stakeholder, because they don't trust their technology, it becomes quite difficult because they think that everything has been infected. They think that every call has been listened to. They often are alert, which they need to be, but it becomes this thing that they think they're constantly in danger and their technology is against them. There are also significant threats that are posed to women's physical safety when technologies are used to track their movements. Again, as one stakeholder explained, the thing about online technology facilitated stalking and abuse is there is no one, there is no place where he can't find you and there's no time of the day where he can't find you. And that sense of being unable to escape it anywhere both heightens the sense of threat and heightens the isolation that the woman is experiencing. The third experience of technology facilitated domestic violence commonly discussed in our study was image-based sexual abuse. This refers to the non-consensual taking or sharing of intimate images. A common experience recounted by participants in our study was that abusive partners were threatening to share intimate or sexual images with the victim, survivors, family, friends, and online contacts. As Anna, one of our stakeholders said, I'm recalling a particular case where a woman consented to her husband taking photographs of her naked, but then the threat was used and the control was, I'm going to show your family back overseas what you're like. I'm going to disgrace you if you leave me. I have these photographs of you. And another stakeholder told us, the husband had installed cameras in the ceiling of the bedroom and was recording and disseminating the film of them having, well, her being raped basically. She was told that if she made any complaint to any authorities about this, he would send those images to her relatives in India. As I said, the family had a lot invested in the success of her arrival in Australia. So that was a serious disincentive on her to take any steps to protect herself. 
When he did distribute the images, her community saw it and the impact on her health was really severe when that happened. She lost her whole family, like they just disowned her. They wouldn't talk to her anymore. As that stakeholder described, there are significant harms that arise as a result of image-based sexual abuse, including humiliation, fear, loss of employment or reputational damage. When adding in factors such as strict religious or familial beliefs about sex and privacy, these harms can be amplified among certain cohorts of women. And according to another stakeholder, the threat of sharing the intimate video went for a long time and then he actually did it. Her community saw it, this is another victim survivor experience, sorry. Her community saw it and the impact on her health was really severe when that happened. She lost her whole family. Sorry, I've already read that quote out. <laughs> um, in our study, one victim survivor described how image-based sexual abuse led, led to a loss of her support network, both online and offline. A victim survivor, Eva, described the following. By the time I decided to leave and report him to authorities upon finding out about the videos he'd been circulating, I had no more social interaction with friends. My university work had suffered detrimentally and I had removed myself from all social media platforms given my insecurities and paranoia and I felt well and truly alone. While there are differences among women within religious, ethnic and national groups, the shame and stigma surrounding female sexuality can be a powerful tool of abuse. Some stakeholders informed us that many women will not report or disclose their experiences due to fear of the punishment and stigma that will be meted out against them and also their children and family members in their home countries. They mentioned that like the other forms of technology facilitated domestic violence, image-based sexual abuse is another means through which perpetrators are able to curtail sexual autonomy, ensure their isolation and further prevent them from leaving the abusive relationship. The fourth and final experience that participate, participants in our study mentioned concerned the way that devices were controlled by the perpetrator, which included covertly or overtly checking text messages, email or social media, restricting access to devices or online sites, or in some cases, destroying devices. Participants spoke about the different ways that perpetrators use technology as a means through which to further isolate victim survivors. For instance, according to one of our stakeholders, there were quite a few instances where phones were confiscated. So women had access to technologies and they were sort of punitively taken away or just removed. One woman talked about having all her contacts to her family overseas deleted. So we took the phone, got rid of them all and she was able to use the phone but no longer able to contact her family. Other participants discussed how perpetrators changed passwords, deleted social media accounts, failed to pay phone bills and physically destroyed phones. For women, access to technology is often the primary means for maintaining contact and relationships with their families and communities in another country. When that access is restricted, controlled or destroyed, the effects can be particularly devastating. To quote one stakeholder, if you're a long way from home, you may be very dependent on things like Facebook to be in touch with your family and friends overseas. It's readily accessible, it's readily affordable, it's portable, it connects you with a lot of people all at once. It's a great way to be in touch and to find support. And if the impact of the use of social media to abuse is that you feel you need to withdraw from social media, such as Facebook, that's incredibly isolating. The potential is that removing women's access to technology is more serious for recently arrived women for other, than for others, because they have fewer other social supports and networks. Our study not only focused on the experiences that immigrant and refugee women have with tech facilitated abuse, but also the barriers to accessing support. And the three barriers that we identified included language barriers, legal barriers, and also insecure migration status. So first in relation to language, this was a key barrier for accessing support with some immigrant and refugee women being reliant on perpetrators to interpret correspondence and information for them. Women also might not have the knowledge of available support services. They might be reliant on inadequate, inaccurate translations by interpreters and not want to describe the abuse in front of interpreters from the women's community. Other language barriers relate to low digital li literacy. Again, this is not unique to immigrant and refugee women. However, when the instructions on how to change privacy settings 
all the instructions on how to request the removal of website content are only available in English. This can further add barriers for women from non-English speaking backgrounds. And this issue has also been identified by Kathy Vaughan and her colleagues who found that while domestic violence services have developed new ways of disseminating information through digital technologies, such as via websites and apps, participants in their study said that the strategies were limited because immigrant and refugee women might not speak or read English. They also might not be well versed on computers or indeed the access to computers and other devices was often limited or controlled by perpetrators. Second, a range of legal barriers was highlighted by many participants in our study as an obstacle for achieving justice for immigrant and refugee women. Some participants suggested that it was difficult to conclusively prove that the behavior was carried out by a certain individual due to the anonymous nature of online interactions and the measures taken by perpetrators to protect their identities. It was also noted that forensic analysis of computers or devices was required by police and prosecutors to demonstrate beyond reasonable doubt that the accused person was the one who'd been sending the messages or carrying out the abuse. And this was often just too expensive or difficult to obtain either for police or the victim survivors and the support services. Participants also mentioned that physical abuse was viewed as more serious by police in comparison to tech facilitated abuse. So upon reporting to police, some women were asked questions such as, has he physically touched you or has he been coming to your house? And, the, and they found that the police were less interested in the tech facilitated forms of abuse compared to the physical ones. In addition to downplaying downplaying tech facilitated abuse, police do not always have the requisite cultural understandings of the implications of certain behaviours. One stakeholder described, for instance, how the sharing of a photograph of a Muslim woman without a um, hijab might not be considered by police or prosecutors as image-based sexual abuse. An additional legal barrier concerns establishing sufficient evidence of abuse in situations where intervention orders are in place. So one victim survivor in our study described how she'd been responding to the messages from her husband in order to capture evidence of his abuse. She felt that she had sufficient proof, but she was told by police that by responding to his messages, she was in breach of the intervention order. Sorry, my cat's just going crazy again. Um, while many of these legal obstacles was not unique to immigrant and refugee women, a combination of language barriers, social isolation, and insecure migration status works to decrease the willingness to report experiences to police and turn further entrapping women in abusive relationships. Indeed, some stakeholders felt that there were so many barriers to seeking justice that immigrant and refugee women often decided to drop legal proceedings altogether if they were pursued at all, because they just want to be left alone. Another legal barrier relates to the lack of knowledge about the laws available to address tech facilitated domestic violence. Domestic violence services in particular described having extensive knowledge of laws related to domestic violence, but a lack of awareness around the laws related to technology facilitated violence. And this meant that some did not feel well equipped to provide advice or to advocate for women experiencing these kinds of abuse. This was particularly problematic in cases where police seemed reluctant to investigate and they thus needed to advocate on behalf of the woman. Other stakeholders indicated that for them, the issue wasn't so much around the lack of awareness of laws, but, but how to manage the gaps in the legislation. These participants suggested that tech facilitated abuse was not well defined in law, and it's difficult for legislation to keep up with the ever changing and different types of technology facilitated abuse. Also, technology facilitated domestic violence is an emerging issue in the sector. Some organisations and frontline staff therefore may not be trained to deal with it and may experience difficulties trying to keep up with the new technologies and the digital platforms. And finally, a third barrier for immigrant and refugee women and one of the most significant barriers is their insecure immigration status. As I've already mentioned, perpetrators commonly use digital technologies to communicate threats of deportation, including losing custody of their children if they leave the relationship or country. For many women with insecure financial or migration status, 
Staying with an abusive partner may therefore seem like the only viable option, rendering them at greater risk of further harm. While existing studies show that immigrant and refugee women do not necessarily experience domestic violence more often than other women, although they may, we're just not sure, a common theme in our study was that perpetrators use use of women's immigrant or refugee status um, was used to enhance or amplify the abuse. So they capitalize on factors such as uncertain residence or citizenship status. They capitalize on partner dependency, social isolation, language barriers, lack of knowledge or understanding of laws and rights. They also capitalize on specific cultural norms regarding gender and marriage, as well as threats of deportation and of course, separation from children. Participants in our study demonstrated the ways in which technology has become a powerful weapon for abusive perpetrators to achieve greater control over the victim survivor and to facilitate her social isolation. This can include acts such as receiving harassing or threatening text, email or online messages, tech facilitated stalking, image based sexual abuse, controlling and restricting access to technology and gaslighting and impersonation. Stakeholders noted that immigrant and refugee women are at a heightened risk of tech facilitated abuse because the perpetrator can use it to facilitate the social isolation, drawing on her tenuous migration status and her financial and cultural dependency. Finally, immigrant and refugee women face unique challenges in seeking and accessing support, including knowing where to go to help. Study participants discussed at length the immigration specific barriers that have significant impacts on women's ability to seek advice and support, which included the language barriers, the legal barriers, as well as women's migration status. One specific barrier involves the availability of culturally competent help. Sharma, for instance, argues that immigrant and racially visible women are often let down by the dominant cultural paradigm, which does not adequately acknowledge or reflect their lived experiences. Other issues regarding service delivery to immigrant and refugee victim survivors includes limited coordination between services, restricted access or eligibility due to visa class or status, language barriers, cultural bias and discriminatory practices. For immigrant and refugee women, there are also other significant structural factors or conditions which shape their experiences of violence as well as their seeking help and support, placing them at particularly vulnerable in a particularly vulnerable position, putting them at greater risk of experiencing further violence and further entrapping them in abusive relationships. In our study, for instance, insecure migration status was a key component that shaped the experience of many women, especially those on temporary or provisional visas who are not entitled to social security entitlements and were therefore dependent on their spouse or de facto partner for both sponsorship and economic support. This finding builds on existing research that recognizes immigration as a distinct sociological location that intersects with other structural inequalities on the grounds of gender, race, religion, sexuality, and socioeconomic status. The confluence of these structural inequalities works together to create what Menjivar and Salcedo call multiple layers of oppression and hierarchies within which immigrant women's lives are enacted. They don't always appear overtly discriminatory and may instead be informed by unconscious bias. So one example for ex is, is domestic violence services whose standardized policies and practices fail to adequately recognize unique experiences and needs of immigrant and refugee women. So for instance, a standard approach to separation might be effective for some women, but may be culturally inappropriate for some immigrant and refugee women because of ill-equipped shelters and the removal of systems of support should they leave their family home. Our study only, took a, only undertook a small number of interviews. But the findings highlight the unique experience that immigrant and refugee women have in relation to tech facilitated domestic violence. And we can also draw some important policy and practice implications from this research. First, enhancing informal and formal avenues of support. In our study, stakeholders from mainstream support services mentioned that immigrant and refugee women do often not want to seek support 
their support when experiencing domestic violence, and instead they may prefer community-based or health organisations that service their ethnicity or religion. So there needs to be an improvement in the capacity of support services to deal with tech facilitated abuse, which includes, for example, further training for frontline workers, including how to identify abuse and tracking devices funding to tailor programs to address the specific needs of women from immigrant and refugee backgrounds, which can include, for instance, hiring immigrant and refugee women in the frontline support roles, and also greater support to understand the applicability of old and new legislation. Training resources and information need to be translated in multiple languages and information should be targeted at places where women frequent, such as schools, supermarkets, health centres, settlement services, and other places. Other informal avenues of support were also recognised as helpful for women, such as online support groups and forums where women can seek support in a safe environment and where they can share their experiences anonymously. Second, there needs to be greater acknowledgement of cultural difference from police responses to judicial decision making within the criminal justice system. So stakeholders in our study stress that cultural sensitivity needs to go beyond providing women with support and advice beyond translating and interpreting services. And third, there also needs to be better community awareness and education around online safety, support options for victim survivors and legislative options. Support services need greater support and resources, resources to deal with increasing reports of technology facilitated domestic violence. And these responses need to be tailored to respond to the unique experience and needs of immigrant and refugee women, as well as other marginalised groups. I think I've got about nine minutes, according to my stopwatch. Um, so in the final minutes that I have left, I just want to briefly discuss the role of the Australian Office of the E-Safety Commissioner. The Australian Office of the E-Safety Commissioner was formerly known as the Office of the Children's E-Safety Commissioner. It's an independent statutory body created by legislation that's been in operation since 2015. The E-Safety Office coordinates and leads the online safety efforts of government, industry and the not-for-profit community and they have a broad remit and it includes providing a complaint service for young Australians who experience serious cyberbullying, identifying removing illegal content online, tackling image-based sexual abuse, and also research and education. I've provided a link in the slide to e the eSafety Commissioner's eSafety Woman site, which, which delivers online training to frontline staff. It provides advice to women about online abuse more broadly, as well as specifically domestic and family violence. And the advice and information is available to download in 12 different languages to assist people who are experiencing tech facilitated abuse. I also want to mention that the eSafety Office was given the responsibility for developing a world first national online image based abuse portal to help counter the effects of sharing intimate material without consent. The portal provides assistance, support and advice for victims such as helping them to get images removed from digital platforms giving victims guidance on how to communicate with someone who has the intimate images in their possession. It also provides advice on collecting evidence and advice on the applicable laws in their jurisdiction. And victims of any age are able to report directly through the portal, prompting the eSafety Office to work directly with social media providers, websites and search engines to help facilitate the removal of non-consensual intimate images. Related to this, the eSafety Office is also responsible for administering an innovative civil penalty scheme in relation to image-based sexual abuse. The civil penalty scheme specifically prohibits non-consensual sharing of intimate images, as well as threats to share intimate images. Under this scheme, the eSafety Commissioner has investigatory powers to administer a complaints and objection system. And this means that a victim or their representative can report their experience to the eSafety Office. And then the eSafety Office can then issue a formal warning, an enforceable undertaking, i.e. a pledge not to do something, an infringement notice, or they can seek an injunction or issue civil, civil penalties for non-compliance. So for instance, the eSafety Office can issue a takedown notice to an individual user or a corporation requiring the removal of the intimate image within 48 hours. Individuals who fail to comply with that takedown notice may be fined up to 105,000 Australian dollars 
and corporations face fines of up to 525,000 Australian dollars. In 2021, a new online safety bill was passed through the Senate with bipartisan support. I'll just talk about this very briefly. Um, the aim of the proposed law is to improve and promote online safety for Australians, including children and adults, and provide victims of harmful digital communications with a quick and efficient means of redress. The proposed bill will enhance the powers of the eSafety Commissioner, and it will increase the responsibility and accountability for industry, including technology companies and digital platforms, with civil penalties in place for both individual users and online services that fail to comply with the removal notices. So essentially it updates four already existing schemes in relation to cyberbullying. I've already mentioned the civil penalty scheme in relation to image-based abuse, so that will also be updated online content and abhorrent violent material. In addition to those four existing schemes and bringing them together in a consolidated act, the proposed online safety bill in Australia will also create a world first cyber abuse takedown scheme for Australian adults. So online services will be required to remove content within 24 hours when they receive a notice from the eSafety Commissioner. And I should also just mention that the um, update to the civil uh, penalty scheme in relation to image-based sexual abuse will also be updated so that content needs to be removed not within 48 hours but within 24 hours. Now just in relation to image-based sexual abuse because I've done a lot of research on that topic I do want to just kind of conclude here by saying that what I know from doing interviews with 75 victim survivors in New Zealand, Australia and the UK, and many of them were also survivors of domestic and family violence, what they say are the key priorities are as follows. First, and I think this relates also to tech facilitated domestic violence more broadly, not just in relation to image-based abuse. So first, victim survivors want greater recognition of the wrongfulness of the perpetrator's actions and of the harms that they experience. Second, they want the platforms and the technology companies to be held account accountable for, holding non for hosting non-consensual images and other harmful content on their sites. They want a suite of justice options available to them. Fourth, they want better education on technology facilitated abuse that squarely deals with gender inequality, consent and respectful relationships education. Fifth, they want better access to technological and psychological support and guidance. And in relation to image-based abuse, victim survivors finally want to reclaim control rather than necessarily seek retribution through the criminal justice system. And without exception in relation to image-based abuse, the key priority is having the content removed or taken down. So in conclusion, domestic violence affects women from all racial, ethnic, national, religious, cultural and socioeconomic backgrounds. While there is little evidence to suggest that immigrant and refugee women experience more domestic violence than other women, research indicates that perpetrators often use women's ethnicity, their religion, socioeconomic position, and their migration status in particular ways to enhance their power and control over them. And this serves to further isolate women from their children, families, friends, and communities, to tie them further to their abusive partners and to re render their migration status even more tenuous. Increasingly, digital technologies are being used by domestic violence perpetrators to communicate threats or harassment, to engage in monitoring and surveillance, to record and to share intimate images without consent, and to control or restrict their access to technology. And while these experiences are not necessarily unique to immigrant and refugee women, immigrant and refugee women are at an increased risk due to the confluence of structural factors such as citizenship or migration status, cultural norms, social isolation, and financial dependencies. And these structural factors also play a pivotal role in shaping immigrant and refugee women's ability to seek help, support, and justice for their experiences of tech facilitated abuse. The findings from this research emphasize the importance of a variety of measures across information support services, legislative reform, and policy that may shape better justice outcome for victims, survivors of tech facilitated abuse. And we also need to raise awareness of this issue more broadly within the community. 
So we contend that greater recognition of the structural factors that shape women's experiences and increase their vulnerability to violence is paramount for guiding the deep seated change that is needed. And that's it from me with 40 seconds to spare. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Nicola, for that. Really um, appreciate the the um, overview of of your of your research and your study. Um, I think, and we've got some questions appearing in the Q and A. And but I think what we'll do is we'll we'll move on to uh, Iman, and then we'll and then we'll circle back to to questions toward the end. Um, so, Iman, would you like to um, lead off? Hi, everybody. Good morning from Australia. <laughs> and I fully understand, um, Nicola, I think maybe a bit of background because we have lots of possums in Australia. <laughs> and uh, my dog used to chase them and really excited. So just to give a bit of background of <laughs> the excitement of the cats, I can fully understand. Um, so thank you so much for inviting me to participate in today's session and um, the panel discussion. And thank you so much, Nicola, for your fantastic paper and the research and your talk. And um, on a, such an important issue of um, technology facilitated domestic um, violence and um, what I call cult women, culturally and linguistic diverse women, which is immigrant and refugee women, because um, I found through my PhD research, there's like an understudy of um, this group of women and often they're not being represented in policy and um, so, so surface. So thank you so much. I And I believe this is like um, the very first of its kind in Australia that um, researching on um, technology facilitated domestic um, violence and um, called women. So thank you so much for that, Nicola. And um, yeah, you're um, so much to take on because there's so many aspects of it. And how I would like to approach my um, comments or response, um, probably is to talk a bit about um, my own research, my PhD research, which is on the um, intersection of technology and um, domestic violence and Chinese immigrant women um, living in Melbourne, Victoria. So uh, maybe I'll go into first uh, to look at some of the differences, similarities in terms of um, the types of um, abuse that they um, reported or not reported that I found, and also following on um, the use of technology um, to respond to um, domestic violence. So um, I've hear all these different types of, you know, um, technology facilitated abuse, domestic abuse, like the harassment, you know, the threats, death threats, um, you know, um, following women, using social platform, involving family, and all that, um, which is very similar to um, what the mainstream, like all the other Australian women have experienced. But in my um, interview and in my research with Chinese immigrant women, um, particularly, what I found is, um, they haven't been reporting, like say things like image-based um, sexual abuse, or um, the stalking, or um, death threats, or involving family as such. But that said, my um, interview is uh, to a very small group of uh, women and on a specific ethnic group. So there's only nine women that I managed to found and, and participate. But I also interview um, some workers as well. So 13 of them who have experience working with um, immigrant and refugee women. Um, the consensus, a uh, um, lot of the women, they're not even aware of that um, their um, partners could use technology to um, facilitated abuse. So maybe that's explained that when I talk to the women that um, they haven't been upfront to say, oh yeah, I have been, you know, my um, partner has been doing this, doing that. So it is actually through the um, um, thematic analysis and through listening to the story that I identified that actually they have been, but they were not able to um, articulate and um, said that, that, oh, this is like, um, what I call TFDA, uh, Technology Facilitated Domestic Abuse. Um, so you have to tease out like the, um, what they have ex experienced. Um, I think some of the interesting um, findings that um, 
I found and compared with um, Nicholas research is, um, first of all, they're not aware of like the uh, nature of it. That's what um, Nicola found, like the nature of the technology facility abuse. And, um, but also I think that what I've been thinking about is like, um, when I talk to them, how I found out is like, like, okay, um, have you been experiencing this? They said, no, 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 um, they're not capable because they're not tech savvy. So in the women's mind, they thought that um, this sort of abuse need like a very like tech savvy, like uh, expert in, you know, a bit like the cyber crime that they heard, you know, like this, you know, people said spending uh, spam mail, people, you know, hack into your account and store your money and stuff like that. So there is a bit of like a um, incongruent in terms of like what they're understanding of. And um, that resulted in, because they're not aware of it. So um, resulted in them not, so sort of like knowing what to do. So um, none of the women that I talked to, they were aware of there is like um, safety apps or like um, online resources. And it's great that um, Nicola talked about the e-safety commissioner because they have so many like useful, helpful tools that can help women. So, but they're doing a fantastic job because um, they are rolling it out and promoting it in different languages as well. Say like I saw in Twitter, they're actually in Chinese language. So that is fantastic to see. So that is great. And um, the other thing is a um, bit of a context because um, in the Chinese community, they're, they're more like a collective like society. So the sharing of um, password devices are quite common. So, um, but that said that again, context is the matter because I'm sure like, you know, um, we all know our password like within our household, you know, <laughs> but we will not go and then um, sort of like abuse our knowledge, so to speak. But for women, um, there's a different story. And the other thing is um, what I found that um, among the Chinese um, women that I interview, they use different types of apps, like not our mainstream um, WhatsApp because like they will use WeChat, Line and um, other like Telegram or other things. It kind of like because like what their um, family and relatives use back home in the home countries. For example, if you want to contact someone in China, there's no way you can use WhatsApp or the other Western um, apps because you, uh, there's like the Great Wall of um, Firewall <laughs> that um, prevents you to use it. So they have to use WeChat. So there's a bit of like a um, implication in, ter um, in terms of how then um, the workers can help them because what I found is um, when they um, turn up to a surface and um, they want to, um, workers want to do like a safety check, it is very difficult because when the phone, like what Nicola was talking about, when that is in, like, that apply equally to the um, phone as well on top of like the um, contents and the resource are all in English, when their phone is in a different language, it's very difficult for the workers to help them to do safety check. So that's another point. And then um, I think I want to um, then to go into the use of technology. As we know, like, like now we're talking to each other <laughs> through technology is so important, especially we found out that, you know, without technology, our life is not much of a life. <laughs> so that's, um, it, that's sort of like equally applied to um, the group of Chinese women that I interview because um, for them, the mobile phone and the smartphone is part of their life, it's embedded in their life. And um, so it, they hold it very closely and it provides them a sense of um, security and safety. Say um, one of the young women that interviewed that um, she was so scared that she slept with her mobile phone next to her. And because she said that if anything happened, she could reach out and contact anyone. And another interesting finding that like Nicola was talking about um, the increased use of GPS um, tracking. There's a significant increase of that. What I found that um, they perpetrators can use the um, GS. Uh, the GPS locative um, media, but what my women, like the, I call them my women, my participants, they do is actually to counter that um, tracking. 
like one woman, she actually, um, because she knew her husband, her ex-husband was tracking her, but she couldn't turn it off. So she also used it to her advantage. It's like, she told me that I saw where he is. So I know that like, if he's not close by, she feel much safer. And also there's also like they would, because their family, some of the families are away. So they will also utilize um, some services to then, um, share their location with their friends and families to protect, like to give them a bit of sense of protection as well. So um, that's another that's another way that they've been using um, technology and also like using um, their um, camera phone to take um, evidence of their, you know, black eyes and things like that. And the other thing I want to mention is the affordance of the smartphone is, um, that break the language barrier in some way, um, because Nicola was talking about language barrier is, is a big issue as well. Um, what, my, um, what I found from my um, PhD research is, uh, because Chinese is their first language or Cantonese, and some of them don't speak much um, English, but they then found out that they could use uh, Google Translate and they show me even during the interview and say, look, this is what you do. Because when I introduce them to some safety apps, they say, well, what it is? And then they look it up and then they will like talk to their phone and then they would immediately um, translate and then um, speak it in English. So there's a great way for them to reach out as well. The other thing is one of the women that I interviewed, she had um, very like uh, severe arthritis and also she's vision impaired but she used the smartphone brilliantly because like that allows her, you know, she got her stick and then she can um, type things. And then um, one of the advantage of the smartphone also is um, it break the isolation because they could now reach out to their family and friends, which kind of like a relationship been um, sabotaged before. So in many ways that um, I would like to stress that, that um, you know, be like um, what Nicola um, talk about the um, victims of um, sexual, like the um, image, um, image based sexual abuse victims, that they really want to reclaim the control. Similarly, um, Chinese women um, victim survivor that I interviewed, they also want to, um, you know, have access to um, technology and they also wanted to do that. Um, so, yeah. Um, to con, I think I got more question than, you know. Um, now we know that 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 is um, they have a unique um, experience and there are so many barriers, you know, in terms of like the support, the legal barrier, the language barrier, the use of um, interpreter, and there's also the digital resources that um, online currently um, they're not um, culturally and linguistic appropriate. It's what can we do to reclaim the digital space and make it safe? Because we know that there's a digital divide as well, like Nicola was mentioning, you know, there's the digital skills that is also a problem. So I think I probably put out there, like, how do we then make sure that the design and um, the technology and all that are sort of equitable and um, to ensure that immigrant and um, refugee women can also utilize all these all these wonderful resources out there. So um, I think that is from me. So um, thank you again um, for um, Nicola for your research and I always learn so much. Um, yeah, so that's from me. <laughs> thank you so much, Iman. That's that's really um, that's really helpful. Um, really great specific um, input and, and feedback and I and I and I do hope we'll we will circle back to um, questions around um, design um, and uh, and equity in terms of in terms of the flip side of technology which is the degree to which that it it becomes a, it is a tool to some extent for um, women in situations of domestic violence and that in, in particular how it may be um, tuned, changed, adapted, developed in a way that centers um, experiences of uh, immigrant and, and refugee women. 
Um, now, maybe we'll switch to, to Deepa um, for, for her comments and then, and then we'll open it up for discussion. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you, Mark. I, I feel like I have very little to add, so I'll try to uh, keep my comments to some of the experiences of the clinic and, and where I strongly agree with uh, Nicola. I, I, have, um, I have certain areas from the paper where I feel like uh, it completely resonates with our experience here in Canada that I would like to highlight for you. Uh, I want to start with a slightly uh, different approach to the conversation, though. I don't think this is an emerging um, form of violence, because at the end of the day, uh, all uh, violence are rooted in uh, traditional intersecting systems of oppression, um, including sexism, misogyny, and, and patriarchy. And if uh, suddenly today, uh, you know, digital access becomes uh, impossible, and there are conversations in countries like India as we speak, emerging where they are saying we will ban Facebook or we'll ban Twitter, uh, so on and so forth. There is there's a much bigger political um, discourse uh, connected to that. But if that happens. Uh, I don't believe that suddenly, uh, you know, the, the violence against women or violence against uh, gender non-conforming people is going to go away anywhere. So I feel like that the root cause of the, the violence and the root cause of uh, the challenges is very similar. And also I question, when do we call a phenomena emerging when it has been now emerging for over two decades at this point? Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we have been talking about uh, nude imagery and we have been talking about um, controlling the phone uh, and, and all of that for, for a while now. So that's another reason why I feel like um, uh, talking about it as an emerging form of violence does not necessarily uh, resonate with me. Uh, in fact, in Canada, uh, if we look at some of the data, um, in 2009, uh, there was uh, a data that came out uh, from uh, people's own self-reporting of experience of violence, which said that 67% uh, of uh, victims of police reported intimidation on internet were women and girls. So this was 2009, yet we are talking about right now in 2021. Now, unfortunate thing about, about the, this data is that that's the only data we have on that from 2009. So that's that's the sad part of it. But um, I feel that the issue has been around for, for quite some time. In terms of uh, people from diverse communities and immigrant communities uh, and backgrounds, uh, why they face intensified uh, form of technology facilitated violence or cyber violence, as it is called sometimes, is uh, goes back to the intersecting form of discrimination. So uh, one of the, the most common one, uh, which also came, came up in Nicola's paper about the hijab, uh, hijabi woman, is Islamophobia. So uh, in Canada, uh, one form of discrimination that contributes to women's uh, Muslim women's experience of safety in public and online spaces is that, and between 2012 and 2015, the police reported hate crimes against Muslim increased by 253%. Um, uh, similarly, the 2S LGBTQ community, and I feel like that's one area which is not as explored, is another uh, target for online bullying, harassment, and hate uh, as compared to the heterosexual uh, populations um, and cis cisgender folks. So that's one another area where we see a lot of uh, a lot of information which is available. Now, some of the discuss discussion points made by Nicola and that I that stood out for me and completely resonate with the work that we do here at the clinic. Um, in, in Toronto is that systemic uh, racism, precarious immigration status, language barriers, and fear of criminality, or, ch or children's protection, all of those are examples of barriers that result in uh, women being suspicious of uh, the systems of a label and migrant and refugee women or, or precarious status women not necessarily trying to get help from the systems. Or when they get help, they feel that the systems are not really ready for them, as in Nicola's paper, it comes out. Um, and uh, some of the other fa factors which are very similar to the experiences here is around the structural vulnerability 
um, uh, to abuse and exploitation, uh, including the digital uh, technology that is being used by the perpetrators. Uh, so uh, some examples from the case studies were very similar in experiences. Uh, so for example, the digital isolation created by say breaking the phone or changing the SIM cards or uh, the en engaging of monitoring and surveillance, uh, communicating threats or harassment. Um, that one, one particular case um, uh, uh, and, and the sharing of the, the survivor uh, who talks about that, it became so difficult that I decided to just be in touch, which Nicola also includes in her presentation today. This is a very, very, very common scenario that we see here in our work as well, where uh, survivors would tell us that they want to stay in contact with him, aid either to navigate um, her safety or if he has access to my phone or my Facebook account, he remains calmer and or I feel that's less harassing than him constantly trying to monitor me and survey and, and, and create surveillance on me. So that, that example was very, um, very similar to, uh, to the experiences here. Um, another very, um, another, another analysis that Nicola put forward, which I completely agree with, is that these experiences are not unique to immigrant and refugee women only, but uh, immigrant and refugee women or migrant women uh, they are at the increased risk due to the confluence of structural factors. So that I completely agree. And, uh, and the citizenship of the migration status, I think is the biggest, uh, biggest barrier a lot of times. And sometimes in our experiences, women know uh, that they have some status, but they're not clear on their, they don't have the clarity on their status. They keep on living under the fear that they will get deported or they are told they can get deported even when they have a status. So there is a lot of uh, this lack of information or, or uh, myth created around them so that they have, uh, they get into a financial dependency, they get into this uh, zone of being isolated and, uh, and, and the abusive environment uh, continues. Um, in terms of the structure, uh, structural factors and how they play a really important role as Nicholas um, paper describes, it definitely uh, speaks to the lack of support. It speaks to the lack of their, their uh, lack of uh, legal system appropriately designed for the experiences of migrant women as well. Um, so, so definitely uh, it's, it's not only that they are experiencing it and they are experiencing this lack of trust. This is, it is also something structure perpetuates or creates. In terms of some things that I would, I'm more intrigued and curious about to learn more about is the manifestation and the aftermath of technology uh, facilitated violence in an immigrant or non-status woman's life. So, and, and, and these intersecting experiences that I'm really intrigued about and, and curious to, to, you know, if, if um, uh, time allows to do <laughs> research about is how do we how do we understand the the impact of the geography um, that um, that women are coming from and that impact of geography is uh, is really definitely frames their experience of technology facilitated violence because uh, what access do they have what kind of platforms uh, as an Iman's commentary. Uh, that we just heard, what platforms they are using, what kind of coded language is being used on these platforms. Those are some of the in really interesting uh, factors that I am intrigued to learn more about and understand more. I have, I do also have some questions there. In terms of some of the other factors that were put forward, like extended families role, role of culture, role of, role of their belief system and the value of the role of the community, um, within their lives, um, I feel like there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of impact of how their reputation or their social wealth is being navigated or maintained through this form of, of oppression and abuse, uh, and and uh, and that discussion would probably need a little bit more nuanced, in depth understanding of what does that mean? Because while all of those factors do play a role in the in the violence that women experience, those very factors are also their social wealth. The, those very uh, factors are their support system. So, but how does that very system, which is supposed to provide them 
uh, the safety net and to supposed to provide them the compassion and the care actually is turned against them for experience of the violence. It all can be analyzed from the framework of power and control and coercive control. And, and Nicola definitely speaks to that in the paper as well. Now, um, a couple of things that I um, was thinking about uh, the, the response in the system and how can these uh, responses be designed for the immigrant women. Um, I think for me, one of the biggest piece always comes back to the status issues. And um, as long as the structure keeps on creating these precarious status, um, and, and more and more uh, precarity in the status, creating um, you know, a lot of uh, fluidity within the status around you are a temporary worker or you're a temporary student and you have status one day and tomorrow you don't. You come into the country, you are a refugee claimant, and then you make a claim, but now you are no more a claimant because you have failed that one first stage of your claim, so on and so forth. So there is a lot of uh, a lot of precarity that is created within the status. So one thing I think in terms of the solution for um, migrant women definitely is to uh, look at the immigration regime overall and how it creates uh, power uh, imbalances in the lives of the women and creates the, 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 the perfect storm situation for abuse and how that can be fixed. In terms of other solutions, definitely a uh, system being more sensitive, cultural appropriateness, um, and, uh, and all of those other good factors within the service provision side of things that were offered are great solutions. Um, and, um, and in terms of the legal reform, I think what one of the biggest pieces around the legal reform always remains is that a lot of legal solutions are looked into within the framework of criminality here in Canada. I'm speaking about Canadian context now. And whereas uh, for a lot of forms of violence that women experience, including the technology-based violence, the solutions need to be found within the human rights framework instead of the criminal framework. Because criminal framework at the end of the day for um, racialized communities actually turns against them a lot of times. And we see uh, the same people with, with, for whom it is supposed to create protection, it creates situation of criminality. Um, uh, another thing which is really important and at the, at the for, at bas basically at the forefront of a lot of discussions that are happening here in Canada around legal reform is uh, thinking about uh, putting the people with lived experience at the center of this experience, uh, creating solutions which are trauma-informed, uh, are intersectional, with the consultation of the community and the groups themselves. Um, and so those are some of the other factors that uh, I'm curious about, and I feel we definitely need to think about more uh, for offering solutions. Uh, and again, as I started, that um, uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, technology-based violence that uh, we see in the work that we do here in, here, here in Toronto um, is very similar um, as, uh, as described in the American, con in, in, sorry, in Australian context, um, I'm sure also in American context, when it comes to immigrant um, communities, but uh, what it needs really is a systemic uh, addressing of the social, cultural, and political uh, systems of oppression, which also are at the root cause of these form of violence, and uh, and just uh, just finding quick solutions would just be like a bandaid and not necessarily uh, take take eradicate uh, the form of violence that that women experience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deepa. The the I. You know the sort of the emphasis on the systemic that that comes out of Nicola's paper, and that both you and 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 Yiman have have talked about, um, is so is so important. And the and the idea that we've got we have fundamental pre problems with pre existing systems um, of oppression that in, in any time we go to try to address. Um, this as if it is, as you point out, something new. Um, we lose, and there are aspects of it that are new in terms of the technology, but, but the, the, the roots of this are, are very familiar. 
Um, and uh, and so I, I just I, I really appreciated your your comments very much. And I just wanted to turn it over to Nicola in case uh, she would like to to respond to some of the things that uh, Yiman and, and Deepa um, that on your your wonderful comments. Yeah, thank, thanks, Jane. And thank you so much, Yiman and Deepa, for your really great um, insights and perspectives in the in the research and work the amazing work that you're doing as well um, I just wanted to um, touch on something that Deepa mentioned about the immigration system and how we need to attend to that and I think that's such an important point and I I think I mean I my my um, uh, co-author Stephanie Vassell who's the second author on this paper she's doing her PhD looking into immigration status in Australia and women's experiences of domestic and family violence who have insecure immigration status. And I guess I just wanted to, um, I'm not sure if Steph's in the audience today, but, um, and I won't ask you to say anything, but I, I, I'm interested um, deeper in, in Jane or whoever about um, Canada's kind of immigration system and whether there are some kind of provisions in place uh, for um, migrant and refugee women who have experienced domestic violence because there is the family violence provisions in Australia and that does allow women uh, to apply to that scheme to try and um, get um, some kind of um, permanent residency or a, a more secure status and I'm wondering whether there's something similar in, in the Canadian context. Nicola, yes there are and um... Off lately, um, the, the uh, uh, recent government. Um, so number one, our our immigration system changes uh, quite frequently. It's one of those areas of law that if you are practicing it on Sunday, if you do not pick up and and read something on Friday, then you might not have practice. So that, that's how often it changes. So um, in terms of the, the with the recent government, recent federal government, we actually have some new provisions that were created. But a lot of a lot of these provisions, just like the creation of temporary status situations, are also very temporary in nature. We have a lot of pilots that are announced. We have a lot of uh, provisions that are announced, but they are only announced for a test period. And, uh, and that sense of that, that these problems need permanent solution is still not there. Uh, and, uh, and when it comes to non-status and precarious status women, as I was saying, there's a lot of fluidity in the status. You, are, you have status one day, you don't have status another day. Um, there is no reason why, um, why that should be happening, especially when you ha have experienced uh, gender-based violence. So because on the, under the convention grounds, um, Canada has a duty to provide uh, safety and security. So when your status is, so my argument is, when your status becomes the reason for your violence, then your safety is in status. And there is no reason why the government should not be uh, prioritizing that. Um, so I hope that answers your question. There are provisions, we, we look really good on paper. Same. Um, <laughs> um, and, and something I wanted to pick up from what Yiman has said, um, about women often not being aware of the abuse. And I know in relation to some of the research that I've been doing on image-based sexual abuse, uh, that there are certainly cases where um, there's secret recordings happening in the bedroom, for example, cameras being set up or uh, photographs, uh, maybe photographs or videos being um, taken together in, in a consensual context, but then the perpetrator going onto porn websites, for example, and sharing those, those images online. And I'm just wondering, you man, and I know I've read your amazing uh, work, um, and I, uh, I'm wondering if, 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 if that was something that was um, brought up by the stakeholders that you spoke to. I know you said some of the women aren't aware of those experiences, but did the stakeholders you speak to, were, were they aware of that? Did they speak much about the image-based abuse? Um, yes, yeah, some of them um, did, and... Um, similar to what you point out into your research paper, it is um, often that will be used as a leverage to um, silence them or keep them in the relationship. Um, in my, um, actually in my um, cohort, one young girl actually have, not as such as like um, being misused of her image, but they use this um, 
couple apps is very popular in the Chinese relationship, I found out. And um, so normal, like um, this young girl was talking to me about um, this app called um, Betrain. And I think it's a Korean app. But what they do is like, um, it is just supposed to be um, just you and your intimate partner and you can send images, videos, all sorts of thing um, to share. And when she was about to leave the relationship, um, it's quite interesting because because they share the password, right? So she knew like how to access his phone, um, laptop and all that. So she makes sure that she, she gone in there and erase everything before she left the relationship. So there is a um, probably that is happening out there, but um, that they were not aware of. But um, yeah, workers that I interviewed did mention that uh, it was their experience that some women did have um, a being um, blackmailed um, because of the um, images. Yes. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for that. And I, it, um, uh, the, just the sort of things that you've just been touching on really raise, um, I'm going to try to, there's a, there's a series of questions in the Q&A that I think raise um, something that's quite interesting, which is when we, when we think about the, the sort of technologically built environment um, and we ask ourselves, are there things that um, platform providers could be doing? Are there things, are there, um, is there software? Are there apps um, that either um, sort of came up in your work um, that are sort of recognized as being problematic for various reasons? Or conversely, are there apps that are sort of being recognized as having features that are particularly beneficial um, for, for um, victim survivors? Uh, and I don't know um, who wants to start us off. Nicola, did you want to start us off on that? Um, I'll, I'll just um, say something about the eSafety Commissioner here in Australia, that they have a safety by design framework, that they are doing some really amazing work in, in, in terms of helping um, technology companies to ensure that the design from the outset of their products and their platforms um, have safety embedded from the outset. So I think that's a really, we are seeing a kind of shift towards that, but of course there are um, a lot of uh, problems with the ways in which um, the design of particular platforms or um, apps are in, in terms of not being able to, well, not necessarily encouraging perpetrators, but certainly allowing them the uh, access to victim survivors. So just one example would be online banking where, you know, you can put in, um, uh, perpetrators put in comments to the, the, um, the victims um, through online banking with the, what do you call it? Sorry, it's kind of early in the morning. I'm trying to think of the word. Um, yeah, man. <laughs> what, a, what is that function called? <laughs> um, the comments, like you can actually put a little description of what the transaction is for. Yes. <laughs> That, that's it. <laughs> um, yeah, so that there, there are ways, I know that the banks in Australia, I'm not sure if this is happening in Canada as well, but the banks are responding um, to try and make that not able to be ha to happen. So so we are seeing some shift, but I think it's slow. I think the the um, the industry is still catching up with, with this. And, and I know with um, Facebook and Google and Twitter, I mean, they are kind of running, um, I'm part of some virtual forums that are happening in the next couple of weeks where they are trying to address this issue. I know that they've, uh, Facebook's um, now got on board Cindy Southworth, who was the former director of the um, NNEDV in the US. Um, so, I mean, that, that there are some efforts being made, but obviously a lot more to do. Deepa or Iman, did you have anything you wanted to add? Apps that, you're, that you may see sort of coming up more more than others. I, I know I see uh, Rhiannon Wong is, is in our audience and BC Society of Transition Houses um, did, did a survey of, um, of uh, support workers. Um, and one of the interesting things I, I thought about that was often when we, when we think about tech facilitated violence, we are sort of reaching for 
you know, we are thinking more about um, apps and social media and so on. But of course, um, phones and texting um, and email are very prominent um, mechanisms uh, for perpetrating um, abuse in these in these contexts. So sometimes it's not necessarily high technology um, that 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 is arising. Um, and I don't know, Deepa or Iman, if if there were, you know, examples that tend to you, you see coming up over and over again. Um, I might jump into this. Um, I think you're absolutely right. Um, it's all low tech. So it's just basically using the smartphone to, you know, the constant texting, calling, and um, using the um, in, um, instant messaging apps, so such as WhatsApp, Line, WeChat, um, the constant bombardment of like, you know, contacting the um, victims. And I think that go back into um, that high tech, low tech, I think there's a misconception out there that um, like the women that I interviewed, they thought there has to be, you know, knowing lots about you know the in and in and out of the phone to be able to do certain things and i'll give you a, another example i think and other um researchers in victoria um in dinkin university i think it's Harmon. he actually did a research on um, the spyware and it's so easily ready available that for a small fraction of money per month you could actually install this spyware in um the victim's phone and they will have no idea that they've been being tracked and that can access all sorts of um, platform like um, the WhatsApp, WeChat, um, Facebook, Messenger. But in my cohort, I think um, the most used um, tools that there was, it was like Find My Phone, which is Find My through the iPhone and also um, the Facebook Messengers because lots of people, they're using the Facebook Messengers, more common um, tools. So lots of the... Um, you know, texting and abuse happening um, in that sense. And um, yeah, in terms of like um, what things are happening as well to help women, um, one example that came, I came across is, um, it's more about the, um, against like uh, looking at the whole picture of violence against women. Um, in Monash, they are um, doing a, what they call a crowdsourcing data, which is like asking um, women and girls and um, or transgender uh, people, if they have experience of like a safety in a public space, they have this interactive um, map. So they can go in there and then put dropped in and spot like a space, and then they can then share the experience. So, um, so there's many things happening out there, like what Nicola was talking about, like Facebook and Google. And I also came to um, know that the World Wide Web Foundation are also doing something and they actually have like uh, principles. So uh, three principles for the government, three principles for the tech company, and then three principles for the internet users to sort of like more like an encompassing sort of like, um, it's not just gonna be fall on the shoulder of the women to have to tackle this issue. So they are looking at more like a round, so like, okay, everybody need to um, like um, work together. And yeah, so that is, it's, that is like some promising thing, but I absolutely agree with you uh, what you talk about. The system is um, broken and how do we fix it? And I think um, Deepa raised a very um, interesting thing about the emerging issue. I absolutely agree. Like, you know, technology, not just the smartphone, but like the telephone and all that has been um, with us for a long time. I'll give you one example. I didn't actually think about it until one woman talked to, I talked to her about what technology facilitated abuse is. And, and then she said, oh, in that case, I have experienced it because um, my, my husband, he just pulled the phone, you know, the landline out of the plug. <laughs> and I thought, oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, that is like, you know, but we all talk about, um, you know, as it's the new thing, but it's have been happening. And I think what, go back to what Nicola um, said um, in her presentation that it, it is like the workers talking about, it is not a separate um, abuse as such, but it's actually an integral part of domestic violence. So that's the way that I see it. So anyway, I better stop. <laughs> so thanks. 
Jane, I, I will take a slightly different stance on it. I mean, I think there is no online platform uh, which exists out there without any risk. Like everything has a risk because this form of violence is um, such, such a, uh, a mishmash of what can happen in a digital space and then what can happen to the hardware. And, and how uh, those two things come together when the violence manifests itself. Uh, and the perpetrators are, are uh, either sometimes actually doing it or they're instilling the fear of that, I know what, which website you attend to, or I have installed this, that now I know what you will be looking at on the, on the computer. Or I remember meeting clients or you know, discussing high-risk situations where clients are saying, I don't know. I, I don't have any, any way to confirm, but it feels like he knows who I speak to, right? And, and, and it goes to the gaslighting tactics, that it goes to the manifestation of other forms of violent, emotional abuse and psychological abuse, which um, happens with it. So it is not a standalone form of violence. It's, a, it's on a continuum and it is part of the the, the violence that happens overall in, in, in that experience. Uh, so therefore, I don't, I don't necessarily believe that any platform is safe from that perspective. But at the same time, I think in this, in this new world of COVID where we have now discovered that, you know, women will text us, uh, you know, more easily than pick up the phone when they're stuck with their abuser, uh, that sometimes video call is not an option for her. And, uh, she would rather just go back to the old uh, old school landline of some kind because that's more safer for her. So, so that does bring us to a slightly different conversation. And that's why I was saying that I'm taking a different stance on this answer question because if we will keep on thinking about digital safety as another provision where we have to ask women to keep themselves safe, then we are, we are, I think we are doing again that wrong that we have been doing in addressing violence against women for a very long time. That we keep on going back to put more responsibility on survivors. You do this, you do this, you do that, and not actually say what is system doing and when will you actually make these companies accountable, when will our police officers start taking this seriously rather than saying, well, oh, just switch off your phone? Or, uh, I mean, I have, I have survivors who sometimes say, I produced my phone as evidence and, and the police officer said, okay, thank you, you can keep it. And not, did not even tell them what, what they should be doing with the phone. The phone has corroborating evidence and there is no direction given to the survivors. So I think the problem, I will take it back to the system um, and, and addressing it like which is safe site and which is not a safe site. It, it is very restricting for a full citizenship right of a woman to use a social space. So first it was treat, and now we are doing the same to the digital space. So I think that's that's where my argument would be, uh, that how do we navigate that? Sorry, Jane, you got muted. That's super important. I, I um, you know, it really does, it really does, you know, it's always, it's always, it always circles back, right? To the, to the, to the same repetitive things, right? Individual responsibilization, um, deferring people's attention from, um, from what it is, from the structures that are around us. So, so what is it about on the online atmosphere? Because it's 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 built on a data in exchange for services model. The the whole the, the money is in generating as much data as you possibly can, getting people to spill as much data as they possibly can. And so the whole the, the whole you know if you go back to Zuboff and and surveillance capitalism, like the whole system is is premised on on. Um, encouraging the release of, of data. Um, and so in a lot of ways, so much of this, you know, the privacy issues also really tie to equality issues as well, right? And human and, and thinking both of privacy and equality, Deepa, I really like your, your comment about taking a human rights approach to this, um, I think is I think is fundamental. Um, one of the other questions that we have in the um, in the chat is whether um, anyone in their in their research um, 
came up with um, responses or indications from people that one of the problems was a sort of lack of access to to the internet, a lack of access to um, technology, and and whether this um, whether there may be sort of any indications that this is disproportionately um, an issue or a problem that may confront um, immigrant and, and refugee women. Um, I'll just speak very quickly about this. I mean, that was certainly something that was brought up in the interviews that we conducted where, um, I mean, not just the, um, the just, you know, the destroying of the technology by the perpetrator, but also the control of access and also the, the limited understanding of how computers and devices and the internet worked for, for many victim survivors, which just added to their sense of social isolation. So it was a tool used by perpetrators to prevent them accessing that technology. And in one case, and I think I might have mentioned it in my presentation of a perpetrator just, you know, deleting all of the, uh, the contacts on the victim survivor's phone. And I think, um, you know, that's certainly a, an obstacle. And I think it's an obstacle for uh, the service providers as well, if they are also struggling with uh, knowing how certain systems and certain apps and certain devices work and trying to help the victim survivor when they don't have a good grasp on it. And I have to say, you know, like I even me, you know, I'm using the computer all day long, um, but I sometimes, you know, the way that my devices sync up or just certain things happen, I think, how did that happen? You know, how did, how did, um, my, how did my phone know that I had a message from my iPad or whatever? And I think, I mean, I, I just find it just constantly changing. It's very, very hard to keep up. So I think for the victim survivors who have, who have just arrived in the country, who are facing all sorts of different challenges, who might not have a job like mine where I'm on the computer all day, um, the challenges for them in terms of, you know, that kind of computer literacy. And, and obviously this it depends on who the person is. I mean, everyone is different in terms of their computer literacy, but it, it does, is a huge barrier. And, and as I said, a huge barrier for workers as well to try and support those women. I wonder, oh, sorry, sorry. Go, ahead. I, I, go ahead. I just wanted to add that Nicholas Weber speaks to the intersectionality piece, right? And that people don't have one, one kind of identity. So, um, an immigrant refugee woman who is new into the country doesn't have economic um uh you know empowerment and doesn't have a job also means that she's living in poverty and sometimes she's homeless so her access to digital digital world obviously would be limited right so i don't have any data to kind of show that new immigrants have access to to uh, don't have access to the same kind of internet or same kind of um of phone systems or or or, or all other kind of stuff but there is a direct connection to their intersectional experience of uh, being new in the country and all of those other factors. So from that perspective, yes, definitely, uh, there, is, uh, there is a divide, a uh, digital divide in our, in our social structures. And again, COVID was a prime example of that. It showcased it very quickly, who has access, um, who doesn't, who can actually work from home and who cannot, and, and we know who couldn't. Um, and uh, and people who were delivering our Amazon orders, uh, who were they, right? And 99% of them were international students doing those jobs. Uh, so in, in, in the greater Toronto area, that just shows you how economy works and what digital access um, or digital empowerment people have. So so I'm just connecting the dots here. I don't have any data to, to talk to. Thank you. Um, yeah, I would like to, um, good question about the digital divide. Um, um, from my experience um, with interviewing the women, um, their issue is more about affordability because, um, you know, they're forever chasing the cheapest um, mobile plan. You know, um, they don't have, you know, I thought that is a given that I have a monthly plan and don't have to worry about it, but they all talk about, oh, have you, have you used this, um, you know, um, Colgan or, you know, the, not the main, like the um, Teddy company, but like all the small one. 
And I'm not sure whether that will have an impact on their connectivity because we know that, that um, Telstra, which is a big um, telco company here, own lots of the towers. So their reception is supposed to be the best. So when you go into like using like a cheapest, you know, um, you know, uh, version, uh, maybe that will impacting on the connectivity. Because the other thing I found out also, they are very um, economical in the way that, that they, um, I have unlimited data, say uh, on my mobile phone, but because of the plan that they got on is cheap, right? So they were like available for a whole year and give you 100 gig. And I was thinking, sitting there, it's like, would that be enough? Like, you know, um, but they would say, oh, we'll just use Wi Fi, like free Wi Fi, you know, things like that. So that is the um, and other dimension of the uh, digital inclusion. And the other thing that being a migrant, one worker told me that imagine like you, you don't, your phone is being, you know, given to you, you know, you don't have access, it's controlled. For us, like, you know, say a student or, you know, work, working, you can access internet at, at work or you go to the library. But for lots of the immigrant women, they don't even know like their own address, you know? They don't even know where they are and they, how do they then know the local library, you know, to access it? So that is an other, you know, um, added sort of like um, obstacles there. And um, unfortunately, most of my participants are living in like um, metropolitan Melbourne. So their connectivity is quite good, even though they're using like um, different companies um, data. And I haven't been reached out to rural. So maybe in the uh, countryside or rural area, they might have um, the connectivity issue. Um, give, I'll give you an example. I uh, used to work in Broome, which is a very remote area. And over there, your data just be eaten up so quickly in front of your eyes before you know it because they use satellite, they use something like that. So I'm sure like if uh, immigrant women that are living in a very um, remote area, they might be countering some issue in terms of the connectivity and the data usage issues as well. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, and I know that that, and um, uh, my colleague, uh, Sonia, Lawrence just posted um, it's it, it's it, it the remoteness living rurally and remote um, living um, is does pose connectivity issues um, in Canada as well and um, in the north um, in particular in the north this has obvious um, disparate um, disproportionate impacts on um, members of indigenous um, communities as well uh, so so that the very infrastructure itself in terms of accessibility is, is, is not there, which again goes to back again to this sort of systemic struct, the systemic structural um, barriers um, that sort of contribute to the, the problem. Um, uh, I think what I think we've covered most of the issues in the, in the, in the, in the chat so far, one of the things I I um I wanted to go back and and pick up on, um, it, taking moderator's prerogative. One of the things that's been happening here in Canada is that there's been a lot of noise by various um, uh, politicians and departments and so on about um, new legislative initiatives um, aimed at regulating platforms, a, aimed at dealing with um, sort of online harassment, online hate. Um, and and um, the e-safety commissioner in Australia is mentioned um, frequently. Um, although we've, at least I can say for myself, I've yet to see in any proposed, currently proposed legislation, we are waiting um, anything that I, I, I feel like resembles some of the things that are the, the, the sort of Things that have, are of, of core importance um, in in the kinds of things that the e-safety commissioner um, is is doing and is capable of doing in Australia, and in particular, it's providing you know to go back to Deepa's point, you know this sort of the fear of criminality, the fear of being involved in welfare or child protection with child protection agencies. The idea of, of informal mechanisms to support people 
in in dealing with um, immediate crises rather than you know as Nicola mentioned also that the you know many people um, in the research that you've you've done Nicola being more interested in um, taking back control um, rather than seeking retribution and so with sort of that long lead up in mind I, I wonder are there are there things about the the e safety commissioner model that you know you would want to say to people um, in Canada as we're thinking about this lessons learned like what's what's there that that works well what's what should be there that isn't there um, sort of anything any kind of tips like that would be would be great. Yeah, thanks, Jane. Look, I think that one of the, the main things is about resourcing. I know that the, um, the recent budget was announced in the Australian context um, to give, I think, $27 million to, towards uh, technology facilitated abuse and online safety. And because of the proposed online safety bill in Australia, where basically the schemes will be expanded so that it will cover adult cyber abuse as well as uh, child child was uh, cyber bullying and image-based abuse. The expansion of the remit of the e-safety commissioner has to come with the resources as well, because once you start to provide a service, which I think is really important and a really great initiative um, to, to also cover cyber abuse against adults as well as children, then you are going to need a lot more resources. You're going to need a lot more investigators working at the e-safety commissioner to, to provide that support and advice to victims, um, but also to work collaboratively with industry to ensure that the victim survivors don't have to take on the work themselves. And I know Deep has mentioned it, Yeman's mentioned it, Jane, you've mentioned it as well about responsabilization. And I think there is a fine line between on the one hand, um, empowering victim survivors to take control and to make the decisions themselves about which avenue they want to go down, um, but also of not giving them all the responsibility for requesting the content be removed, for collecting the evidence, for doing those types of things. So I think the, the eSafety Commissioner and any other kind of other examples internationally, I think the kind of thing is, is really to... to um, to take that fine balance between empowerment and also intervening and helping and taking on some of that work. Um, but I think also the other thing is really around prevention and we haven't really spoken that much about kind of primary prevention and perpetration. I know we've definitely talked about the need for systems to, you know, the immigration system or the, the tech industry. And I think that those things that absolutely important but I think also in terms of education um, and, and, and dealing with you know gendered violence and gender equality um, in, in schools and universities I think that that's really important too and it's a, an important part of the conversation and certainly the eSafety Commissioner are doing a lot of great work um, in that space as well um, in addition to responding to um, these forms of abuse. So I hope that answers your question. <clears throat> Yeah, that's 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 helpful. I don't know, Iman and or um, Deepa, if you if you wanted to sort of comment on on that. I just want to say uh, to both Nicola and uh, Iman that um, I I mean I would love to know more about the how commission is working in, in Australia because in our uh, conversations it is talked about quite a bit. It's very popular in Canada. I don't know how popular it is in Australia, but, but the commission is really popular here in Canada as part of the solution that is offered. Um, and I, I truly believe that any, any structure when created is only as good as, as the application of the policy and the framework that comes with it, right? So if it is going to be another rubber stamp, I would, don't want any another bureaucratic framework to be created as part of the solution, um, just so that someone can say that they have done the due diligence and that did not talk about um, uh, technology facilitated violence ever again. We see that with a lot of forms of violence. Um, we also don't have a national action plan here in Canada. We are working on it. 
um, uh, conversations have started now. Uh, this year is where a lot of consultations happen. And with one thing, and I was I was involved in some of those conversations. So one, one thing that came out very clearly in those conversations is again and again that any solution for survivors shouldn't be without them and, and without consulting with the experts who work with them. So I think those two notions are, are very, very um, clearly coming out uh, from the voices of a lot of feminists who are engaging in that process here. Amen. Um, I haven't got much to add on to that, but yes, definitely the um, prevention and the primary prevention yeah, is important. Um, like one worker told me that, you know, all her job is to, you know, people in crisis, uh, which is not unusual for immigrant women to only seek help at the last minute. And what she wanted to see more is like, can we do something before that? Because all I'm doing is bandaging up the solution, but it's not actually a solution. So that stay true. And um, yeah, and I absolutely agree. Like um, the lip surface is like, we would need real changes, not just like um, oh, it's a hot topic now, you know, is, you know, we'll get them votes, you know, let's get on the, jump on the bandwagon, but actually the uh, issue still say the same, because it's, um, doing this research make me a bit disheartened in one way, but um, also, you know, uplift in, in the other, it's, it's such a mixed um, feeling, because domestic violence has been there for so many years, you know, it's not a new thing, you know, it's still happening, and then when I listen to women's, like, the narratives, their story are still the same, you know, but it's just sometimes with the added dilemma of the technology, you know, like what Nicola, like, talk about in her um, presentation, it is like an extended, you know, is just exacerbating what is ex actually happened. So we're not actually, in a way, we're not actually tackling the, like, again, what Nicola said, the, the core problem of the gender inequality, you know, um, all that is still there. And now we got the new, like, you know, the technology facilitated domestic abuse, you know, that we need to then um, put attention to. So, but, on the upside is I have seen changes. I have know that like, you know, feel like many years ago, domestic violence is not even a crime, you know, it's a bit of domestic, you know, yep, you deal with it yourself. And, you know, some women still hold that because from their host country, home country, that is what happened. So I think that also deter them to seek help because oh, well, um, you know, say like in China or Hong Kong, there's a more, more like a family harmony, you know, police will not, listen or they will think oh well there's no sexual violence happening here you 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 got you you are like a couple aren't you you know things like that you know so that is um so i've seen the changes in australia so um criminalizing um domestic violence you know um they're taking it more serious with in terms of the intervention order although some perpetrator will say that it's just a piece of paper but there's still some deterrence and um the latest in australia i think is talk about the coercive control is so prominent in um, emotional abuse, you know, in the whole package of domestic violence is that control, you know, not necessarily physical, but there's all this um, sitting behind it is the control and the power. And there are big debate here happening in Australia to whether to um, criminalize um, in coercive or control as well. So that is um, being discussed. So, um, yes, yeah, so watch this space. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, so we've got it. We've got about four minutes left. And this is probably a pretty big question to leave off on. But I, I feel like it's a, an important one. So we've, we've, we've talked about, you know, experiences of uh, immigrant and, and refugee women in relation to tech facilitated um, violence. Um, in the in the domestic sphere, and we've also expanded out a little bit to recognize that 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 violence is often a reflection of broader violence from a number of intersecting systems that that operate to affect uh, neg negatively affect the lives of of immigrant and what refugee women. And one of the questions that we had posed for ourselves when we when we met was, how do we engage with questions of 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 difference or diversity in a meaningful way. And, and how do we do that without getting caught up in debates about which cultures are either more or less violent or more or less tolerant 
um, than than others. And I don't know if it, who would who would like to. I don't know, Deepa, if you would like to lead us off on that one or not. Jane, full disclosure, I got distracted. So if you don't mind repeating the question. <laughs> sure, ab absolutely. Um, it was it's a, it was the question that that we had uh, that we had posed when we met earlier about um, questions of difference. How do we deal with questions of difference or diversity when we're talking about women from um, various cultures and communities and backgrounds? How do we deal with that in a meaningful way um, and do that without getting caught up? in debates or sort of reaffirmations of stereotypes about certain cultures being more or less violent or more or less tolerant of, of violence. Thank you, Jane, and I'm sorry for, for that distraction. Um, I have literally locked myself in the room so that this doesn't happen anymore. Um, in terms of experiences of diverse women and how uh, the solution sometimes is, is, is found in, uh, this is a religion, this is a background, and this is, you know, it's, it's, there is a comfort in it. It's because people who are trying to problem solve, they want to problem solve anything in a simple way, create a box, put this in a box, create a checklist. So it goes back to that notion. Some of it is also uh, the colonizers, um, uh, the colonizers baggage that systems carry where, uh, you know, uh, there, is a, there is a Eurocentric model which is perfect and anything which deviates from that Eurocentric model, there is a problem and that's what might be the problem that we are looking at, right? Instead of going back to understanding that it's patriarchy, it's misogyny, it's power imbalance, it's the, stru the structure that creates violence, the same, same uh, constructs that we apply to a mainstream survivor, if you just take those constructs and start applying to the migrant women survi survivorship, you would see that there, it's, it's, it's very similar. It's on very continuum. Where things need to be different is when you're pro creating a service provision where you want to be culturally sensitive, where you need to want to create language accessibility, where you want to make sure that she actually uh, wants to talk to you because you look like her or maybe not want to talk to you because you look like her because there would be both kind of experiences. I think it's the service design and creating the narrative around the experience. Those are two different concepts, but what happens is that in simplifying and getting into the zone of savior, savior mentality, we conflate everything. Um, so when I read Nicola's paper, it's it's an it's an amazing way of writing about it where you're keeping the integrity of the intersectional experience at the center and the heart of it and then you're weaving around the problem around it and and that's not a simple task it's a complicated task but then that complexity is something that we need to keep in the center of these experiences which people sometimes find difficult to manage it's too much there and then let's just make it simple let's just create a checklist and and if she's, she, if she's from India, it must be this. If she's from Pakistan, it must be this. If she's from China, it must be this. But, but we, are not, we are not monolithic in our experiences also. India is diverse, China is diverse, Cambodia is diverse. People don't, uh, don't come with the same experiences. That world doesn't exist anymore. We live in 2021. There are people, um, <laughs> my teenage daughter in Canada is less Canadian um, more Korean and my nieces living in living in Delhi are more uh, British than than Indian. So it's all like it's 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 getting all mixed up, and people need to stop putting labels. It's not worth it at this time. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, it happens. It happens, and it happens pretty frequently. But I think Nicola's paper is a good example of of you can center it around people's experiences rather than putting it around the labels. We're, we're now at 601. Um, I feel like that was such an am amazing um, response and such an amazing way to, to wind things up. I'm conscious of everyone's time. Um, I wanna thank all of you for this really rich conversation and for all of the great ideas that 
that came from this conversation and from um, comments and, and questions from the, uh, from the audience. I'm sorry, we, I don't think we got to everyone's question, but we, but we tried. Um, and so this is the, this is the, the last of the um, events in the Tackling Tech Facilitated Violence um, Conference. Um, a really powerful way to, to end off um, Deepa and uh, Nicola and Yiman, we really appreciate your, your time. I want to thank all my co the co-organizers of the event. Um, shout out to, especially to Amanda Turnbull and Michelle Liu for all of their support in, in, making, the, um, in making these events um, happen. Um, and uh, my co-organizers, Sonia, uh, Karis, um, Pam, and, um, and, and of course, Susie. And this, this is this won't be the end of the conversation. It's really only the beginning of, of, a, of a real effort to rethink what we mean by tech facilitated violence and to think about it structurally, intersectionally, and systemically, um, both in terms of understanding how it how the, its different manifestations and also um, how it is that we might like to or ought to be um, responding and whose voices need to be centered as we, as we go through the process of, of trying to figure that out. So, so thank you to everyone. Thank you to our audience for, for being here. Um, and uh, the, the, this event has been recorded and, and we're, we're hoping that we will um, post it on the Tackling Tech Facilitated Violence um, website. And, um, and thanks again, Nicola and Iman. I, I don't know if you're able to go back to bed now or not, but you probably you probably you probably feel like it. Uh, and take care, everyone. Um, and uh, and bye for now. <laughs>